ladies, gentlemen, dear brethren, colleagues and friends, welcome to Open LLF this evening or morning, depending or on whenever, wherever you are in the world. It is my immense joy and honor to introduce a distinguished intellectual and scholar, a prolific writer, a worldwide leader of Freemasonry, a close and special friend, Very much. my dear brother Fabio Venzi, the Grand Master of the regular Grand Lodge of Italy. I met Fabio in the year 2000, more than 21 years ago, when he was visiting Turkey as the Grand Secretary of the regular Grand Lodge of Italy. This was when my dad was the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Turkey. Yes. And the regular Grand Lodge of Italy was just born. By the way, he doesn't look that old, uh, but I met Fabio as a friend of my parents. Yes. I precisely remember the moment we were introduced to each other. This was during the cocktail of the bowl that follows the annual communication of the Grand Lodge of Turkey. He was standing uh, next to Giuliano di Bernardo, philosopher and founding grandmaster of the regular Grand Lodge of Italy. By the way, another impressive personality. However, I was then a young Freemason and was immediately charmed and attracted by the youth and energy of the Grand Secretary. Thank you. Since then, I had countless occasions all being a source of joy to meet him. At the outset, these meetings were dependent of my parents. Later, I modestly contributed to the leadership of the Grand Lodge of Turkey, which gave me the privilege to independently collaborate with Fabio for the good of Freemasonry at an international level. I have always been inspired by his diplomatic skills and energy. There is no doubt that Fabio Benzi is one of the worldwide prominent leaders of Freemasonry. Fabio is a quote unquote political leader of Freemasonry, but also an intellectual one, which makes him quite unique as these two levels do not always go hand to hand in Freemasonry. As he is our guest at Open LFM with his intellectual identity, I wish to say a few words on this. Fabio is a sociologist by formation, uh, graduated from La Sapienza with various interests and a multidisciplinary approach that led him to do research on the sociology of religions, social psychology, and esotericism. Obviously, Freemasonry is at the interface of all these domains. And Fabio is one of the most important and worldwide recognized researchers into Freemasonry of our days. He is the founder of two Masonic journals, laureate of several prizes, regular speaker in conferences, author of countless books and papers, among many others, his book on Freemasonry and Neoplatonicism was particularly mind-opening to me. Fabio is also an expert on the relationship between Freemasonry and the Catholic Church. And his talk today is entitled Freemasonry and the Catholic Church, 300 Years of Misunderstanding. As I always thought that the Catholic Church had very well understood what Freemasonry is, I am eager to hear what Fabio will say. My dear Fabio, we are all extremely happy and honored to be able to host you at Open LFM today. And we look very much forward to listen to your talk. You have 45 minutes and then we will go to questions and answers. The floor is yours. Thank you very much once again. I thank uh, the dear brother 
and dear friends, Renzi, for his work and for his uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renzi. And good evening, everyone. Thank you in advance for your attention. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate to this open lecture. <clears throat> I will not use uh, slides, images, anything, just words. And I know that it's very difficult to keep the attention on the words. So I will do my best to keep your attention alive. I promise you, I try not to be too boring. So from the time of its uh, inception, Freemasonry has been uh, forced to deal with issues of anti-Masonicism. This uh, phenomenon was first manifested in an episode that, to that took place as early 1652, many years therefore prior of the official birth of Freemasonry in 1717 and the establishment of the Grand Lodge of London and Westminster. This episode is known as the Kelso incident. The accusations were direct at the Reverend James Ainsley, Minister of the Church of Scotland, Due to his uh, indecorous membership of Freemasonry, the rituals of which were purported to convey equivocal saints and a terrible, a scandalous secret word. Okay, since, since then and up until the present day, a constant attitude of a criticism and denigration has accompanied Freemasonry throughout its history. The reasons underlying this uh, phenomenon are hard to comprehend, particularly in the light of the fact that Freemasonry, despite its evident differences, is linked by a common denominator, by a primary objective of a benevolent works that consists in providing assistance to, in those, uh, to those in need. The numerous criticism and attacks on Freemasonry highlights how likening of the craft to Satanism have always been present. But what distinguishes the attacks of the Catholic Church is their systematic nature, their continuity and their violence. So these considerations are taken from my latest essay entitled The Last Heresy and from other writings that I have dedicated over the years to the problem of relations between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry. So a profusion of papers and studies has been published with regard to the conflict between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry. A wide variety of topics has been addressed and very much hypothesis put forward with regard to the opening up of a possibility of a dialogue. To date, however, the relationship between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry remains confrontational, controversial, and above all, confused. In the recent decades, although on the one hand should not be ignored the clear propensity to dialogue displayed by several bishop conferences, in particular Scandinavia and South America, on the other, a clear hostility continues to be evidence of the policy towards Freemasonry. This situation has now reached a position of stalemate and the Catholic Church has issued a condemnation towards Catholics who belong to a Masonic institution. A 
Freemasons lie in a state of a great sin. In this speech, I would especially like to emphasize how the Catholic Church today applies two different approaches with regard to Freemasonry, two different approaches with the common ultimate aim. The first, which we could call official because adopted by the upper hierarchies, which might be defined as a politically correct approach, is based on a non-aggressive manner of dealing with Freemasonry, emphasizing the incompatibilities with the Catholicism, particularly from a doctrinal point of view. And I'm referring to the allegation of deism, relativism, or gnosticism. The other approach implemented by the lower member of the Catholic Church tends particularly to provide a negative portrayal of the personality of the Freemason, focusing in particular on his nature and irreparably uh, evil, satanic, and heretical nature. It is primarily this latter representation of Freemasonry that has been conveyed throughout the century to the majority of Catholics, ill-equipped to grasp the elaborate dissertation of the relativist or gnostic components of Freemasonry, but who are centrally pervious to an overt and direct accusation of Satanism moved against the heretical Freemasons about doctrine, doctrinal attacks. So with regard to the doctrinal movi uh, motivation underlying the incompatibility between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry, have be proven the complete groundlessness of the latter, highlighting how they purported relativist or agnostic components of Freemasonry are indeed based on spurious analysis and volatile distortion and even more serious, lacking specific reference to any of the Masonic rituals. In this accusation of relativism, Catholic Church refer generically to Freemasonry parts and point of any specific Masonic ritual are never men mentioned. And therefore, it is not clear where specifically there are relativist elements and thus a refutation is in this way impossible. The glaring, regrettably frequent mistake encountered in almost all document on the topic is to represent Freemasonry as a homogeneous or uniform phenomenon, overlooking or ignoring the fact that it was first established in England, spreading to Europe and worldwide with a large variety of forms and rituals as a result of the historical context in which they first saw the light and subsequently took shape. For this reason, the contents of the Masonic ritual, hundred and hundred throughout the world, may differ considerably, and they are so diverse as to prevent any form of generalization. Therefore, it's my opinion that speaking of Freemasonry in general, is not correct. We can speak of Freemasonry in a reference to specific rituals. It is their contents that determine the nature and that form of Freemasonry. For this reason, in my, in my studies, I have always proposed theories on Freemasonry based on a specific rituals. One, one of, of the most used in the world is the emulation and for the Royal Arch, the Aldersgate ritual. 
As I say, the modern time, the anti-Masonicist action of the Catholic Church are based in a dual lever of communication. The first, the official lever, is based on a doctrinal, scholarly approach. Whilst the second relates to the masses and is undertaken by means of non-official messages, which, however, are by no means less effective, pervasive, and harmful. One of the one one of the many Catholic authors who have dealt with Freemasonry writes that, and I quote verbatim now, I personally believe that in Freemasonry there is an explicitly Luciferian cult, some satanic cult. I believe that the Masonic cult of the great architect of the universe is objectively and intrinsically agnostic, esoteric, and Luciferian cult. As we know, this is simply false and absurd. I have, I have been studying English rituals, in particular emulation ritual for 30 years. I never found anything about Lucifer. Father Giovanni Caprile, a very famous Jesuit and scholar of Freemasonry, Catholics, of course, in an article published in the periodical La Civiltà Cattolica. La Civiltà Cattolica is one, one of the most important publications of the Catholic Church. In 1957, maintained how, even in the recent time, Freemasonry, in its most light and Luciferian forms, resorted to the use of women to bribe young Catholic priests. And this is not in the Middle Ages, but about 50 years ago. The priest Don Curzio Nitoglia, a pupil of the very famous Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce, is a well-known essayist who collaborates with a series of Catholic publications. In his essays, the attacks of Freemasonry reach fantapolitical peaks, particularly in the say, the occult forces of subversion. Don Curzio Vittoria explained how a current act of subversion has been elicited by four capital agents Judaism, Bolshevism, liberalism, and of course, Freemasonry. In the opinion of Don Nitoglia, we found ourselves today in the midst of the final stage of the subversion, the monialism, which since 11 September 2001 has been seeking to gain the control of the entire world in order to build a sole temple and one universal republic under the domination of Israel and America. The two nations dominated by the, the main agent of chaos, Freemasonry, of course. To this regard, mention should be made of Monsignor Antonino Romeo, very important uh, member of the Catholic Church. Romeo highlights parallelism between Freemasonry and Satanism, and in the very important a Catholic encyclopedia, he writes, I quote verbatim, the most profound and widespread Satanism is the apotheosis of mankind with a decline in religion and morality. The main focus of the Satanic cult is black, anus orgies combined with Eucharistic desecrations, better still if chaired by a corrupt priest Derivation from, from the ancient Sabbath, accompanied by grotesque practices reminiscent of a Masonic formulas and rites. Freemasonry is without doubt a secret den of Satanism. Freemasonry, with its unique spirit and fundamental laws, is the international Antichrist. I emphasize that the sentences I have just read are taken for a, from a very, very important document 
the Catholic Encyclopedia. One of the best known anti-Masonic tests of the 20th century, very, very popular, is Freemasonry and the Anti-Christian Movement, written by the Irish Jesuit, Edward Cahill, in 1930. Cahill maintained that Freemasonry was without any shadows of doubt, a true enemy of the Catholic Church. Cahill opined that from the dechristianization of France to the birth of Bolshevism, the major and most inauspicious historical events took place under the inspiration and guidance of Freemasonry. Essentially, in line with the theories put forward to by Cahill, all negative events that have taken place in the more recent historical epochs, including revolution, social upheavals, assassination, and religious persecution, have been ex executed or inspired by Freemasonry. And the Cahill text could not fail to contain an accusation of Satanism, with Satan being the main object of worship for Freemasons. I would like to remember that when this book by Cahill was published in 1930, it was a real bestseller in the Catholic world. So the, docu the documents I have read are only a very small, very small part of the thousand and thousand of similar documents that have been published for years under the ages of the Catholic Church. How could public opinion not get a negative in the idea of Freemasonry and its member? Why all this hate of the Catholic Church towards Freemasonry? Whatever is the late motive to be identified in the context of this vast and composite panorama of accusations. At the time of the first document of excommunication in Eminenti Apostolatus Specula, the book uh, in uh, 1638, was Freemasonry a threat to the stability of the security of the Vatican State? For many historians, yes, in their opinion, the key motives underlying the hostilities directed toward Freemasonry by the Catholic Church, or rather the Vatican State, were largely political in nature and related to the issue of national security. But the truth is that the two known lodges inside Vatican State were the lodge in Rome, the lodge in Florence, they had both a very, very small number of members and certainly not enough to, dis to disrupt the security of a well-armed and well-organized state. So I would abandon the political explanation and I will briefly illustrate my theory. In my opinion, it is in the initial thought, or rather the accusation of heresy, the common denominator that subsequently denoted all successive accusation involving Freemasonry of a certain, certain gnosticism or relativism. The Catholic Church in a series of forms and using a series of instruments from the time of a publication of the first document of the condemnation, as unfailingly and blatantly deemed Freemasonry an overt heresy, and consequently labeled its members as heretics, blasphemous, and evil. The accusation of heresy is indeed the light motive that has undeniably influenced all the attacks and criticism 
direct towards Freemasonry over the period of three centuries. The first document directed against Freemasonry, we, we know, uh, issued by the Holy See, the Papa Bull in Eminenti Apostolato Specula, a through encyclical highlighted in reference to members of Freemasonry, I quote, we moreover desire and command that both bishops and prelates and other lo uh, local ordinaries, as well as inquisitors for heresy, shall investigate and proceed against transgressor of a whatever state, great condition, order, dignity, or preeminence they may be. And they are so pursued and punish them with penalties similar to those applied to individual, individuals being most suspect of heresy. It was simply written. Subsequent confirmation of the motivations underlying the bull, particularly in, in reference to the suspicion of heresy, was afforded by an edict by Cardinal Ferrand in Rome in January uh, 1639, a few months later, the issuing of the eminent, ineminent, the Apostolato Spero. I quote, indeed, these aggressions, meetings, these aggregations, meetings, and conventicles are suspected of occult heresy. It, it's clear, we have, just have to read. In subsequent, uh, in subsequent papal documents directed against Freemasonry, the accusation of a heresy was repeatedly reiterated, underlying in particular how the heresy presented in Masonic ritual rises to overthrow, endangers the purity of the Catholic Church faith. This is in the Providas Romanorum, the bull of 1651, was the purveyor of perverse doctrine. This is in Traditi Humiliati, an encyclical of 1829. And more importantly, was, I quote, sacrilegious, infamous, blasphemous. This is in the encyclical Mirari Vos, 1832. Above all, I would like to underline how many historians have guilty, in my opinion, underestimated the reason that led to the closure of the lodges in Rome in 1637 and Florence in 1639. That the reason underlying the publication of the excommunication were not ex ex exclusively political, but specifically doctrinal, was confirmed by the consistory who convened at the, at the request of the congregation of the Holy See, the 25 June in 1637. So few months prior to the closure of the Roman Lodge. A consistory held in order to examine the situation of the Florentine Masonic Lodge. This consistory, presided over by the Pope, saw the particip participation of the head of the Holy Office and the Inquisitor of Florence, Father Paolo Ambrogio Ambrogi. The Acta Historico Ecclesiastica with regard to the news of this consistory stated how in Florence, the Inquisition had identified these guides under the generic name of Freemasonry and over heresy, more specifically an occult form of Molinism on quietism. Whilst in Rome, the same sect Freemasonry was reported to have occultly practiced a form of Epicureanism. With regard to the accusation of uh, uh, quietism or Molinism linked uh, with the activities carried out in the Florentine Lodge, 
It should primarily be specified how a series of Debert doctrine have been associated with quietism, each of which may be identified on the basis of the sentences issued by the Holy Office, particularly in the 17th century. On the subject of Molinism, Miguel de Molinos, a Spanish uh, theologian, is deemed the first theorist of a quiet quietism. Molinos uh, advocates such a passive and receptive form of a religious behavior, a state of quietude, that saw in inner annihilation as a privileged means of achieving the cleansing of the soul, a state of a perfection that consists in contemplation and total peace, such as to enable a direct relationship and a true union with God. The accusation moved against the text related to the fact that this behavior implied a permission to indulge in the pleasure of the flesh. The, the accusation of immorality moved against Molinism or quietism were based essentially on the fact that once the soul had been cleansed through the annihilation of inner and other activities, Men had nothing more to ask from, for, uh, from God. And thus, as he was no longer able to see, he would not have needed to resist the temptation. The accusation moved against the Epicureans doctrine were reiterated over the century and Epicureanism, although not openly considered an heresy, continued to be condemned by Christian thinkers. Accord, accordingly, Dante Alighieri placed Epicureans in the sixth circle of, uh, cycle of the Inferno, the city of this, dedicated to heretics. Indeed, the poem held the opinion that Epicureans were those who claimed that with the body dies the soul. The accusation of impiety against Epicurus were very common in the Middle Ages and took their cue from both the Pauline polemic against Epicurean last and the early Christian father, in particular Lactantius, Lactantio, who saw the Epicurus, the negator, the providence, the assert of immortality of the soul, the destroyer of the religion, the preacher of lust, the lover of vanity. So uh, what conclusion therefore can be drawn at the end of this, uh, of this speech? That the Catholic Church is uh, ignorant, don't know the diversity and singularities of the word of Freemasonry, indiscriminately issues documents contains a series of historical and doctrinal errors, or that the Catholic Church is indeed aware of these differences. But despite this stance to, to gain from representing Freemasonry, particularly to the faithful, as a homogeneous phenomenon which can accordingly be more readily identified and defeated. And if the latter is true, then why? It is an acknowledged fact that since the publication of the first Papa Bull, the Catholic Church has opted to the North Freemasonry, not as a charitable association or an initiative school, or merely as one of the many esoteric movement like Rosicrucianism, but rather as an overt religion, a specific, a specific choice that the would does ever render it justifiable the consequent accusation of a heresy. But we all know that Freemasonry is not a religion. As demonstrated in recent decades, the official documents of the Holy See 
have been accompanied by books, interviews, and TV programs involving lesser members of the Catholic ecclesiastical hierarchy who had, in, one, in an absurd and far-reaching manner, focused the attention of the observant Catholics in particular and the public opinion in general on a purported satanic component of Freemasonry. Why does the Catholic Church allow members of the clergy to, to produce and publish similar volumes or participate in television programs? With regard to the document cited, it is somewhat are to believe that the authors published their writing without first obtain approval from the higher ranks of the Vatican. Thus, as long as the Catholic Church continues to authorize the publication of similar abhorrent, groundless, and misleading documents, it's my opinion that the possibility of a true understanding of the Masonic phenomenon by the Catholic Church war, by the Catholic world, will prove to be quite impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsey. We thank you, dear Fabio, for this brilliant presentation. So I will now pass the word to the participants, uh, you are welcome to uh, ask questions, make comments uh, on the uh, chat option, but also please uh, don't hesitate to raise your hands uh, to, uh, to speak. Uh, but before giving the word to the, uh, to the audience, I wish to add something dear Fabio, if you allow, as the discussant. Uh, in Italy, particularly in Italy, you see that Freemasonry uh, is not only attacked uh, by the Catholic Church, uh, but also uh, by the political class and the uh, judiciary. Uh, this occurs in various countries in the world, but uh, this is quite strongly observed uh, in uh, Italy. By the way, two months ago in August, uh, in Open, LN uh, Open LFM, uh, we had the privilege to listen to Mike Kersley on the Roberto Calvi affair. Uh, so it was a very interesting talk. So uh, I would ask whether you have any uh, comments, uh, particular comments uh, on this. Uh, it's true, it's true, Renzi. Italy is a very particular situation. I want to show a from a general point of view, the, the problem. So what element therefore might have resulted in the development of such a widespread negative conception of a suspicion and in many cir circumstances, persecution of Freemasonry, even reaching a state of over mysonophobia. I have attempt therefore to identify an alternative explanation that I will refer to, uh, to as the scapegoat theory. In the midst of the crisis, every society or community feels the need to identify and stigmatize a certain number of scapegoats. Per i fratelli italiani scapegoat e capo respiratorio, on whom to place the blame for the misfortunes that have occurred. I shall briefly summarize the scapegoat theory put forward by the famous French anthropologist and philosopher René Girard, demonstrating a clear pertinence with the dynamic of uh, anti-Masonicism also in Italy, in particular in Italy. René Girard believed in the presence of a moment of uh, in history in which the multitudes that we might also identify in power in a generalized sense, arbitrarily picks on an individual or a group of individuals, in this case, Freemasonry, deemed responsible for the disease that affects their society and 
annihilates this person or group of person. The theory of Girard is expounded in detail in his work, uh, The Scapegoat, published in uh, 1982. Although the authors had previously referred to this theory in a previous volume, Violet, the very famous Violence and the Sacred, published in uh, 1962. The conditio sine qua non underlying the manifestation of a scapegoat, un capo espiatorio phenomenon, is undeniably a crisis that grieves society, without which there would be no need to identify a scapegoat. Representing first and foremost a social crisis, René Girard ex explained how, at some point, a strong tendency to justify the latter by means of social and particular moral causes is developed. The, com the community, I quote Girard, the community strive desperately to convince themselves that all their ills are the fault of a lone individual or a group of individual who can easily be disposed of. Which are the most frequent recurring accusations once the persecutory process has been triggered? René Girard illustrates a list of three distinct types, violent crimes, sex crimes, religious crimes, like the profanation of the communion host. Uncovering the history of the anti-Masonicism, it is clear that the accusations made were used in the historical diverse situations and periods in the attacks against and persecution of Freemasons. Very briefly, violent crimes. In addition to all quotation made in the first part of my speech from the first bull of excommunication Freemasonry, we detect reference to the social danger of Freemasonry and its member. I quote, as Freemasons are not only most suspect of occult heresy, but furthermore, threaten the public peace and safety of the Holy Church. Indeed, the society of Freemasons were, was said to endanger not only the tranquility of the temporal state, but also salvation of the soul. In the next Papa Bull, Ecclesia Maiesu, we read that Freemasons are animated by particular hatred and meditate on menacing and pernicious objective. The second point was the sex crimes, the accusation of immorality and indecency as long being a recurrent charge against Freemasons. In, very, in a very famous document, the Freemason uh, Udibra, Udibrasic poem, dated uh, 1722, a lewd and obscene poem, the London Freemasons was accused of having sexual relations with a well-known prostitute of the time, Salis Salisbury. But sodomy was another accusation freely directed against Freemasonry. The American famous historian, Margaret Jacob, stating that Freemason, I quote, throughout the 18th century, they had been accused of dissolute conduct and sodomy. To rebut this accusation using fact, the Mason oscillated between encouraging and excluding female participation. However, once again, the most violent attacks were yielded by the document published by the Catholic Church. In, in Eminenti, in referring to members of Freemasonry, openly mentions of wickedness and perversion. In Ecclesia Maiute, uh, Aiesu, we read that uh, Masonic Association favored the most inhibited pleasure. In the bull Quo Graviora defines Freemason as perverse man. In encyclical Qui Pluribus, 1846, or referring on the Masonic relationship, mentions 
sacrilegious unions and moral corruption, and we could go on. This accusation indeed represent the late motive present in all official documents written against Freemasonry and have continued up to the present day. The last, the last point, religious crimes. Amongst the religious crimes, Girard, René Girard, refers to the paradigmatic crime of the profanation of the communion host. This type of crime is considered in the broader and more complex accusation of heresy, long moved against the members of Freemasonry, and in the specific accusation of Satanism. Specific reference to the profanation of the body of, body of Christ was present in the previously cited document, Ecclesia Maiesu, issued by the Pope Pius VII in 1821, in which the members of Freemasonry are purported to gather in, I quote verbatim, clandestine and illegitimate assemblies which, which they convene after the manner employed by many heretics. They profane and defile the passion of Jesus Christ by their impious ceremonies. The elements indicated by René Girard as distinguishing the scapegoat all seem to be clearly and unequivocally present in all these statements. A very brief mention of the Italian situation. In Italy, due to a constant uh, pervasive process of delegitimization, the public perception of Freemasonry has undergone a slow, albeit progressive, negative evolution, with the consequence that the true nature of Freemasonry has been irreparably distorted, distorted and altered. In January 2018, the report, the conclusion, the document of one investigation conducted by the Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission relating to the infiltration of Cosa Nostra Mafia and the Andrangheta Calabrian Mafia in Freemasonry in Sicily and in Calabria were, were published. I personally was implicated as the grandmaster of one of the Masonic Grand Lodge summit, and therefore witness of the fact presented herewith. I should like first to highlight how the errors committed and the gravity of the omissions presented in the document are, at the very least, inexplicable and the content of the conclusion completely misleading with regard to the public interest that the document itself initially proposed to meet. At page, page five of the document of the report specifies how the objective of the under, undertakings of the commission were the mutual interest to Freemasonry, being to, I quote, prevent contamination by the mafia of legitimate and historic private associations. So everything therefore seemed to point to an objective investigation yielding an impartial outcome. Re regrettably on progressing, the document changed, toned drastically, becoming inquisitional, deceptive, insinuating, are almost threatening. It was, uh, however, undoubtedly the last paragraph of the report entitled The Catholic Church that was the most disconcerting. I remember you that we are talking about a commission of the Italian parliament. In this symptomatic paragraph, the commission deems it necessary to remind to the Italian parliament that, I quote, 
based on the Declaratio de Associanibus Masonicis issued by the Cardinal Prefect Joseph Ratzinger, subsequently Pope Benedict. There is an irreconciliability between belonging to the Catholic Church and being a member of Freemasonry. I know, is this matter of interest to the Italian Parliament? Indeed, the conclusion of the same paragraph of the document of the report were even more disturbing. The Commission saw fit to inform the Italian Parliament how recently, I quote, Pope Francis dismissed the credentials of a foreign ambassador present in the Vatican as he was a member of Freemasonry. It was incredible. So the Vatican state was giving the, the Italian state lesson of uh, in diplomacy, indicate in a loving and critical manner, the right way to war to the member of parliament and the Italian government to expel from Italy all foreign ambassador suspect of being a Freemason. If I remember well, in the, in the introduction of the report, the Masonic Association has been defined as legitimate and historic private associations. It is undeniable that amongst the members of the Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission, there were members particularly active in portraying a negative picture of Italian Freemasonry, included the president, the Catholic Rosy Dick. To conclude, based on the content of the report of this document, drawn up by the Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission, might the reader reasonably infer the guilt of Freemasonry that the Masonic Grand Lodge have been sentenced? No, because there is no need, as the judgment of Freemasonry is quintessentially implicit. The judgment had been determined a priori based on years of mediatic slander, defamation, and lynching, and unchangeable judgment. And indeed, the issues of the Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission was extremely Kafkian. The Commission did not subsequently recommend or dispense any punishment to Freemasonry, as there were, was no need. It was already been made implicit the delegitimization had already taken place de facto. All daily newspapers and periodicals, both in Italy and abroad, effectively condemned Italian Freemasonry. Thank you, Rex. Well, we thank you, dear Fabio. There are hands that are raised, also several questions and comments coming from the uh, chat. Uh, I will give priority to the chat, first of all. Uh, there are two uh, different but related uh, comments and questions uh, which I wish to share with you uh, for your reaction. Uh, first, uh, Marcus Moore uh, asks the following, what importance is still given in the Roman Catholic Church to the Leotaxil hopes in 1897? And also he continues by saying, how does one distinguish regular Freemasonry in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church with anti-clerical quasi-Masonic orders and irregular uh, grand lodges. So these two questions on uh, the importance of Leo Taxil uh, in the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman, the Roman Catholic Roman Church view on regular and non-regular Freemasonry comes from uh, Marcus Moore. Marcus Moore. Uh, and, uh, and there is a... There is a second uh, question from Hugo Nail, uh, who says the following, uh, I agree completely that the Roman Catholic Church used to regard Freemasonry as consistent around the world, but now recognizes that there are many organizations calling themselves, but do not abide by the original principles maintained by English Freemasonry and those recognized by it in other countries. However, the original encyclical by the Holy See against Freemasonry in general says that the Churchill objection was based on rumor and hearsay. 
do you think it is the case that successive popes until very recently have simply supported that view rather than question it? So, Fabio, uh, what would you, uh, what would your reaction to be, uh, be, be to those questions? The first two question that are, uh, the episode of uh, Taxil is, uh, is very well known. Taxil invented everything and the church, the Pope, Cardinal, uh, think that uh, all the document of, of Taxil was true, but it was, uh, but was a joke. And there was a very, very famous episode of uh, in the, the history of the Catholic Church. Leotaxi was an inventor of the uh, Satanism and uh, the presence of the sacerdotessa of the, of the, the Satan, all invented. And uh, at the end, after many years, Taxi in Paris, in the open, uh, uh, lecture explained that it was all a joke. So Taxil is a uh, dark pages. And uh, uh, the other question was, uh, uh, I don't remember. So uh, the question is, uh, well, two related questions. Uh, one is that, uh, how does one distinguish regular Freemasonry in the eyes of the church? with anti-clerical quasi-Masonic orders and irregular Grand Lodge. So whether this distinction between regular and irregular Freemasonry matters for the church. And also uh, brother Hugo Nail uh, makes a similar uh, point. And he notes that the original encyclical by the Holy See against Freemasonry in general says that the church's objection was based on rumor and hearsay. Do you think it is the case that successive popes until very recently have simply supported that view rather than question it. But uh, as I said in the in, in the speech, the problem is that Catholic Church don't do different difference between uh, inside Freemasonry, the regular Freemasonry, irregular Freemasonry, uh, atheistic Freemasonry is one uh, uh, core, is one body is Freemasonry. In the document of Catholic uh, Church, there is never differences between the different form of Freemasonry. Only in a document of the uh, Cardinal Shepherd, uh, before, uh, the, uh, before Ratzinger, Shepherd written uh, a difference between the Freemasonry, the Grand Lodge, that uh, machinantur contra ecclesiam, and Freemasonry and Grand Lodge, the Don Judas. But uh, after this very important document of the Cardinal Shepherd, uh, Apostolic Letter in 1964, if I remember, Ratzinger, after, declared that uh, there is no change of vision of the Catholic Church, and there is no good Freemasonry and bad Freemasonry. There are Freemasonry. But Shepherd was a very big step when he explained that the excommunication was only against the Grand Lodge that Machinantu contra, contra Ecclesia. It was a very important document for Freemasonry, but after everything change. So there is no difference now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Fabio, uh, now I will give the word to, uh, to the audience, those who raise hands, I'm trying to see. Uh, David, uh, David Cicinadze, uh, please. Thank you so much, uh, fraternal greetings and thank you, brother Fabio and Brother Ramsey for excellent uh, presentation. I have uh, two questions which are quite interrelated following the topic of today's discussion and very interesting insights that you shared during your talk. Uh, what is the situation between Opus Dei and Freemasonry currently in Italy and or in other Catholic states? 
Well, uh, brethren, on Saturday, all these lectures I've hosted uh, uh, have frequently mentioned close to open persecution of Freemasonry in some European and some Latin American countries. Uh, more somewhere, less uh, somewhere, so in other places. And the second question would be, would you, would you see that there might be any way out or any change of the status quo sometime in the near future regarding the position of Catholic Church regarding the Freemasonry? From a very perspective, from a very personal perspective, I mean. Okay. Uh, so um, between uh, Opus Dei and uh, Freemasonry, there is uh, absolutely no connection, nothing. <laughs> and uh, the uh, approach of the, of the Catholic Church, as I say in the speech, in the, some uh, bishop conferences in South America, there is a Openly uh, behavior uh, activity from the bishop. So the South America and Scandinavia is a true uh, good relation, true uh, good um, situation in which the conference episcopal dialogue with uh, with Freemasonry. And uh, in my opinion, as I said, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that in the, in the future will be the possibility of uh, changing about the relationship, the relationship, because this is possible only if Catholic Church uh, understand the difference uh, in Freemasonry between the regular lodge, irregular lodge, uh, atheistic lodge, and different grand lodge. So only if uh, Catholic Church won't uh, really uh, understand and know the phenomenon, the big and complex phenomenon of Freemasonry. It will, it will be possible. But uh, if a Catholic Church approach Freemasonry as a sole body, it was impossible because Freemasonry, as we you know, is different. Just to clarify, so uh, there is a uh, friendship between Opus Dei and Freemasonry in some no. Catholic Church. Did I understand it correctly? No, he said no. He said okay. in no way there is a relation. And also he said that he doesn't see in the near future a change okay. between the thank relations you. between the Catholic Church and uh, Freemasonry. We thank you, dear David. Uh, well, there is a question uh, coming from uh, Brother Swat Akman. Uh, which I will convey, and also I will add uh, a question of my uh, own, uh, maybe to heat the debate. Uh, so Brother Swat Akman asks the following. He says that, do you think that philosophers like Giordano Bruno had scared the Vatican against organizations uh, like Freemasonry and other esoteric uh, movements? So this is the question of uh, Swat Akman. So whether people like Giordano Bruno scared the Vatican against organizations like Freemason and Esoteric Movement. And at this point, I wish to add, Fabio, uh, my own question comment uh, as well. Well, we have uh, the tendency uh, to say that, well, Freemasonry is not unique. I certainly agree. Well, there is regular Freemasonry. There is irregular Freemasonry. And well, if the Catholic Church had to know to distinguish between regular and irregular Freemasonry, well, they will not act as such against regular Freemasonry. This is an argument that I think you are uh, making uh, as well. However, uh, well, we should note that, of course, Freemasonry is not homogeneous today. But as you also mentioned, the first excommunication of the church uh, came much earlier in 1738, uh, when there was no such distinction. Freemasonry was more or less unique and homogeneous. So, uh, of course, this brings the question uh, why uh, this excommunication came in 1738. And there I will make a comment of my own, and I would like to really hear your reaction on this. Well, Freemasonry is a system uh, based on reasoning through symbols. And as such, uh, it is quite open uh, to being heterodoxical. 
And it's also about freeing the human mind. And I don't think this is good for a system based on uh, dogmas and also Freemasonry. I'm speaking about regular Freemasonry that, for example, we practice under the Grand Lodge of Turkey. Well, it's about the meaning of existence. This is what we are searching uh, under the Grand Lodge of Turkey. And the church also presents the meaning to the existence. Whether this is the same meaning, I don't know, but this is certainly different methods. So in that sense, I would agree that for the Catholic Church, Freemasonry is a heresy with giving a positive connotation to the uh, term. So, uh, well, I would like to ask you, what do you think all about uh, that? Uh, and I will tie this to the question of Suat Akman. Uh, Giordano Bruno, I mean, all these philosophers of heterodoxical uh, traditions, uh, well, the Catholic Church always had problems with, with that. So isn't Freemasonry is a product of that tradition of heterodoxy? So, uh, well, your reaction to this, I will be very happy to hear it. No, it is a sick. Thank you, Ramsey. So, Giordano Bruno is an incredible thinker, a genius, big philosopher, but he has nothing to do with, with, uh, with Freemasonry. And uh, so, there is, in my opinion, no connection with the uh, symbolism or uh, idea of Freemasonry. In, I think that is more uh, near the Neoplatonic thought, Freemasonry. And uh, your question about uh, why in the 1638, the accusation of heresy, because we don't have the ritual of time, but uh, uh, Catholic Church was convinced that uh, in the ritual there are something that is not good. This is the point. So I think that it's correct to remember that uh, the, the Roman inquisitor uh, who collaborated with the Pope in preparing the inemininti apostolato specula, the document that you cited, undoubtedly referred on drafting the document to a statement issued previously by Pope Paolo III in 1542. The document is the bull Licet ab Initio. In this document about everything, we read that we give to them the power to inquisitor, so to search those who live the way of God and the true Catholic faith and who practice in the mistaken way or who are in the way under suspicion of heresy. But what are the ritual, the Masonic ritual at time? It's not uh, the present ritual, that, uh, the ritual that was uh, used at time, was different. For example, the Dalfrey, the Dalfrey manuscript, number four, number four, dated in 1710, one of the most ancient ritual, but near the time in which the bull of excommunication was uh, created. A catechism contained cre clearly, explicit, repeated reference to Christianity. The text, like, um, likewise, the Sc of a Scottish uh, origins, uh, belonged to the ancient Lord of Dumfries. In this, in this catechism, at the very start of the prayer of the admittance, we read that uh, the Almighty Father of holiness, the wisdom of the glorious Jesus, through the grace of the Holy Ghost, this being three persons in one Godhead. Subsequently, the ritual became more explicitly Catholic in this section relating to the church. We read, in primis, you shall serve the true God and carefully keep his, uh, his precept, in general, particularly the Ten Commandments delivered by Moses and Mount Sinai. As you have then explained in full of the pavements of the temple, Secondly, you shall be true, steadfast, 
to the Holy Catholic Church and shun all heresies, schism, or error to understanding. So we can see that in the ritual of the beginning of 18th century, there are present an uh, element of uh, Jesus Christ, St. John, Trinity, Holy Spirits, and all these elements maybe can uh, put the Catholic Church to see in this use, not a, not a correct use. This is my idea of why. I, I think that the Catholic Church re read one, <laughs> maybe better than many Masons, Freemasons, but they, <laughs> they know. I think that the uh, Italian in, uh, Church Inquisition know the, the, the ritual. And they think that in the, in the ritual, there are something uh, wrong about the purity of faith. Thank you very much, dear Fabio. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I see uh, Marcus Moore uh, from Paris. Uh, Marcus, good to see you. And hi from Paris, indeed. Uh... Hi, um, I would like to share with you a poster that uh, I found in Paris uh, uh, in uh, January this year. Can I uh, uh, show that on the screen? C can you see that? Not really. Uh, can you get it closer to the camera, please? Mm -hmm. Stop. Can you read it, Marcus? It's not oh, okay. Okay, okay. It's, it's much better. Okay, yes. Okay, so um, it, it's hard because it's not on a screen. But uh, all right, I, I'll read it to you. It's stop uh, pedocrity. That is uh, stop government by pedophiles. Uh, Sauvons les enfants des abus rituels franco maçon that is, say, uh, we save our children from the uh, ritual abuse of Freemasons. Now, this was actually in January this year. And it suggests that uh, maybe somebody was um, trying to form a QAnon chapter uh, here in, in, in Paris. I, I removed this, uh, I have to say. It was in the Bois de Boulogne. Hello? Yes, we are hearing you, we are hearing you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was in the Bois, Bois de Boulogne, so uh, I, I, I took, it, uh, took it down, but uh, I was uh, amazed that, uh, you know, something so childish to suggest that uh, there was uh, abuse of infants by uh, Frank um, uh, Freemasons. Okay, thanks. I think that Marcus Moore, thank you, confirmed my speech, my theory. Thanks, dear Marcus. And now, uh, Giuseppe Magazzu. Giuseppe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ramsey, for uh, Brother Ramsey, for um, allowing me to, to speak. And um, uh, thanks to uh, Grandmaster uh, Fabio Ramsey for um, you know, uh, the historical explanation that I found very, very interesting. Um, there is um, a small premise that I would like to um, introduce um, before the question, uh, which is based on a kind of logical reasoning um, base. Um, we know that masonry is a peculiar method and system of morality and uh, veiled with uh, allegory and illustrate by symbols. But um, at the same time, we know that it's strictly and strongly characterized by gnosis and gnosticism. And I reckon that before every uh, sort of structure that we might identify as a conflict between the two parts, in this case, we are uh, identifying the theological part with the uh, um, Roman Church. 
and uh, Catholicism, but it could be addressed with many other type of um, approach to the matter. And um, I reckon that um, the nature of the problem uh, of being accused and blamed uh, of relativism is, um, is based on one um, crucial um, fact. Um, if we look at the semantic of the uh, word uh, uh, heretic, it comes from Irao in ancient Greek, which means choosing. So the, the Gnostic approach to certain types of matters that are, uh, as, as we know, uh, introduced and specified in the old charges um, are basically on, 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 on identifying um, a Gnostic path to certain type of matters, which is not claiming to substitute in any way um, theology, but that goes into contra in, in contrast uh, with uh, an esoteric approach to certain matters, because we, we work on Gnosis, Gnosis and Esoterism, and church is working on, the, on a parallel path on dogmatism, doctrine, and esoteric approach to the matter. So I, the, the question I would like to ask is, would that uh, be identifiable um, as, uh, as the primarily, um, as, a, as, a, as the prime type of trouble we have in, in, contra, in kind of contrast we have well, with um, Catholic Church and um, religious institutions just in general. Thanks. Giuseppe, ho capito, ho capito tutto l'inizio, ma, ma la domanda ho un pessimo audio. Fammela in italiano. Tutto il principale ho capito, la, il tuo ragionamento. Se, se fondamentalmente eh, il fatto di avere un approccio gnostico e avere un approccio dogmatico, quindi la differenza è che noi abbiamo un approccio gnostico che viene considerato ovviamente eretico, basato anche sulla gnosi e sull'esoterismo. Quindi la visione esoterica riservata a pochi che attraverso un percorso interiore arrivano a una verità che può essere anche diversa da quella che fondamentalmente viene fornita. Il minimo comune denominatore è l'esistenza di Dio eh, e il fatto di riconoscere un'entità superiore. Però c'è una differenza di arrivo al punto cruciale che è l'esistenza di Dio, l'accettarlo come essere superiore, perché noi abbiamo una visione gnostica esoterica, mentre loro hanno una visione prettamente dogmatica, dottrinale ed esoterica, che è, una, che, che è un po' una forma diciamo, più fruibile dalle masse, ma meno eh, compatibile con una visione esoterica. Quindi la domanda che vorrei porre è, può essere che alla base dell'incomprensione, che è comunque presente negli All Church, ehm, ci sia questo diverso arrivo? a una visione che comunque ha un punto di incontro, ma che non viene accettata dalla Chiesa Cattolica. Ok, understand. So, uh, Giuseppe, the, uh, the problem of the accusation uh, of relativism and gnosticism are very, very, very uh, complex. And I think that we don't have the time time this evening to explain because it, I think that we need to another open lecture because the problem of relativism is very, very uh, complex uh, problem. I say that, that there is no present, but we have to say that the first time that uh, uh, appeared this uh, accusation was very, very uh, few years ago in 1980, after the conference of the Bishop of Germany. So it's a very uh, big uh, uh, problem that uh, need many time. But the problem of agnosticism, Giuseppe, uh, the Catholic Church don't attach a Freemasonry uh, from uh, the point of view from your point of view, there is no uh, Gnosticism as a, a search of knowledge, but uh, mainly the attach is in front of the historic Gnosticism. This is the point. We have to do different from historic Gnosticism and the Gnosis as a path of knowledge. There are two uh, things completely different. The uh, Catholic Church usually attach Freemasonry because uh, they think that they are near the theory of historic knowledge. 
for example, for example, the amoral vision and the acosmic approach, not to the path of a corner sense that we know as Gnostic. So, so uh, we have to explain the difference. Catholic Church is focused about the similarity, the attachment between Freemasonry and the historic Gnosticism with all the characteristic of the historic Gnosticism. Relativism is a philosophical position that denies the existence of, uh, of an absolute truth or critically calls into question the possibility of reaching the absolute and definitive definition. You know that in Europe, we recognize the fair appearance with the Greek sophistry. Later, relativist opposition were expressed by ancient and modern skepticism, criticism, empiricism, pragmatism. But in Freemasonry, we have the truth. We search the truth. So it's impossible to de uh, definite definite the ritual, Masonic ritual, relativist. But thank you for your very interesting uh, uh, question that I want also personally answer to you. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. Thank you very much, Fabio. Well, I uh, hope to uh, pack up the session at uh, within eight minutes. Uh, but there are a few, uh, a few other hands raised. Uh, I see Ozan, Ozan Arslan. Uh, Ozan, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you are okay. always compact and to the point, but uh, yes. given that we don't have uh, much time, sure. I would ask you to be even more compact than to the point. Than usual. Yes. Of course, once again, a fascinating subject and a great conference. So I would like to thank the uh, organizers and dear brother Venzi. Uh, actually, you mentioned that the Bull of 1738 did clearly have a political and international dimension, uh, and I believe it also had international repercussions. For example, 10 years after the Bull of 1738, the Ottoman Sultan Mahmoud I actually using the Bull to some extent as a pretext banned also Freemasonry in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, my very short question is that, do you see any connection between the papal bull of uh, 1738 and the Hanoverian succession of 1714 in the British Isles, uh, when there was this dynastic change after a long antagonism with Catholic Jacobites. So there was really like very strong anti-Catholic sentiment in the British Isles. And if I'm not wrong, uh, at the time of the papal bull of 1738, James Francis uh, Edward Stuart, so leader of the Stuarts, uh, head of the House of Stuart, I mean, leader of the Jacobites, the elder son of the King James deposed in 1688, he was living in exile, actually, in papal state in Rome. So do you see any kind of connection between the bull of 1738 and the Jacobites uh, and uh, in exile, actually, in continental Europe? Thank you. Thanks, Ozan. Thank you, Ozan. Uh, as I said, I don't believe in the political explanation. And uh, uh, the presence of Jacobites in, uh, in Italy, in, in the um, Lodge of Rome and Florence were, was very, very few. Very, uh, there is no, no much important. So uh, I continue to think that the political explanation is, uh, is not good they take away from the truth. I read the document. If I, if I see that uh, uh, there is one accusation that is heresy, as is put in every document of the Catholic Church, I think that the true explanation is heresy. So I don't believe the, the Jacobites' presence in Italy, in Italy was so important to uh, create this uh, document for uh, attach the Jacobites uh, uh, member. 
Okay, thanks, Fabio. And uh, now I see, uh, sorry, hand raised. Antonino, Antonino Plutino. Yeah, so first of all, I just want to say, you know, thank you to uh, Fabio Venzi for, uh, uh, you know, this subject. I've uh, been actually, you know, trying to uh, research a lot on this subject because I have so many questions and um, also so many answers, you know. So I do have a, like a comment on my own, but I first wanted to ask a very uh, simple and short question to uh, Fabio, which is why do you think um, Catholic Church um, is against Freemasonry? and has, you know, communicate Freemasonry. Why do you think it's that? Okay. What's your opinion? Thanks, Antonino. Uh, Fabio, uh, maybe let's do the following. Uh, there are no more uh, raised hands. So uh, I wish to uh, make a few uh, final comments and then leave the floor uh, to you uh, just for uh, a conclusion. And in fact, my comments are quite uh, related to what uh, Antonino uh, asked. By the way, uh, before that, I want to read a comment uh, which came from the chat by uh, Douglas Russell. Uh, he makes an observation and says that despite the official position of the church, at least some local parishes are not anti-Masonic. And he continues by saying, I have a friend here in Southern California who converted to Catholicism long after becoming a Mason. He met with the local priest, discussed the issue, and was welcome into the congregation. So this is what Douglas Russell uh, observes. Well, I would say as a personal uh, comment, of course, uh, this reconciliation is certainly possible at an individual uh, level. But uh, I see it harder at the institutional uh, level. By the way, today we are talking about the Catholic Church and the relationship with uh, Freemasonry. But of course, this question is not restricted to the Catholic Church. You can look at Islam, for example. Well, there are several Muslims who can reconciliate Freemasonry with their faith. But if you look at Islam and its pure orthodoxy, uh, well, there is no church in Islam as the Catholic Church, but the Islamic movements, the Orthodox Islamic movements, well, they will all be against Freemasonry. Well, look at Judaism. Well, of course, you can be uh, from the Judaist confession and live Freemasonry. But when you look at the Orthodoxy, you see again them against Freemasonry. So the problem that we are discussing is not really restricted to uh, the Catholic Church. There is something which makes Orthodox religion fear uh, Freemasonry. And what is this? So uh, when Fabio said, when the Catholic Church read the first rituals, they see something bad, uh, well, quote unquote bad. Well, now I am asking the question of, I am uh, re paraphrasing the question of Antonino, if I may, saying that re whether really there was something bad uh, in Freemasonry for the Catholic Church. Of if you were the Pope, would you excommunicate uh, Freemasonry or uh, not? So Fabio, I leave you uh, the last words uh, to conclude uh, this uh, marvelous evening, which we had thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you, Renzi. I agree with you. There are many Catholic priests in uh, Freemasons' lodge, but they have uh, not the power for change the situation. But it's true, there are also in, in my lodge, there are Catholic priests. And uh, Antonino asked me my opinion, but I am here as, uh, today as a historian. I have ex exhibited documents, facts, and my personal opinion is, is not important. Because uh, if I give my opinion, I have to explain what is for me Freemasonry, and uh, it's a very complex uh, explanation because for me, Freemasonry is a, a mystical path. So we don't have time for this, but maybe in the next, uh, in the future, open leg two, 
we can speak about the mystical way of Freemasonry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. Fabio, we thank you very much. It has been a, a marvelous uh, evening. Uh, first and most of all, uh, thanks to uh, you. Uh, and of course, uh, with all the participants and all the uh, comments, uh, questions, uh, I wish to uh, thank uh, each of you very cordially on behalf of Open LFM. And I will also like to remind that we will be meeting next month in uh, November, 27th of November. Uh, the speaker will be Robert Collis, who will be speaking on Avignon Society and uh, Freemasonry. So uh, I wish to uh, see each of you uh, next month uh, in November uh, in Robert Collis's talk. Thank you very much uh, once again, Fabio and all of you. Have a good, day. Have a good day. Have a good time. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.